The Philadelphia Eagles come off a big victory over the New York Giants to take on a much more formidable Cincinnati Bengals attack. The defense has stepped up as of late, but this will be a great test to see where they're at, while the offense looks to keep the good times rolling. Welcome to the Philly Film Room Podcast. Along with my co-host, Eric Sidewater, I'm Nick Waters, and today we have a great show for you where we're going to be discussing everything Bengals and Eagles. But before we get to that, as always, Eric, let's hear your thoughts on that big Eagles victory over the Giants. Uh, It's obviously the Giants, so just like the Browns, I'm not going to get too excited. And I do think this upcoming matchup will be a good litmus test to see where the team really is at. But I think we saw more evidence that the edge rushers with their hands on the ground are more effective, which I've highlighted that as a significant development for the health of the team going forward. Um, Cooper DeGene looks like a revelation compared to what we were using at the nickel. So I'm encouraged by that. And now we're, I think we can all say Quinion Mitchell is a good NFL corner. It's just a question of how good he can be. Um, on the offensive side, it was rough. Hurt. I saw a lot of bouts of tunnel vision from Hertz missing open guys. And, but the good thing is the run game looks amazing. So Nick Sirianni talked about it briefly in a press conference that they feel like if they need to be a running team, they will be. Now, will he hold up that end of the bargain when it comes time to call the plays? We'll see about that. Uh, But yeah, they really need to clean up the pass game, but they're just continuing to build continuity. But if, if anyone follows me on Twitter, they'll see I criticize some of the vanilla concepts they're running. Eventually, Kellen Moore is going to get more autonomy in this offense, and I think we'll see some more emotion, more formation diversity, and hopefully that starts this week. Yeah, we really saw the diversity in the run game last week, so hopefully that continues into the pass game this week. But when we look into this matchup, this might be a run-heavy approach for the Eagles again. But let's jump into this Bengals offense because it is a potent attack. That is for sure. It is led by head coach Zach Taylor, though Dan Pitcher is the offensive coordinator. It's headlined by Joe Burrow, Jamar Chase, and T. Higgins, and they rank 10th in points per game, 14th in yards per game, and they're 8th in EPA per play. So, Eric, what did you see on film when you're preparing for this week? They're getting the ball out very quickly, especially from these spread formations, four and five wide, and really use, utilizing the whole field. Burrow is a quick passing savant. When he catches the ball, you can just see how quickly he's scanning the field. And I almost liken it to like a baseball player when they're loading up. They, a baseball is coming in so fast. You have to be really early in your preparation to actually hit it. He's exactly like that when he's going to throw the football. And so much so that you'll see many times he'll eat it and just stop throwing it because he'll see it wasn't open but if it was he's ready to deliver it it'll pose similar issues to what we saw against the Buccaneers but now the Eagles defensive backs are playing tighter than they were against the Bucs and so I'm just curious to see how much that may neutralize this attack I think tackling on underneath throws will be paramount Um, if they don't get it to their first read Burrow's really good about getting it Uh, to a check down his running backs in space. Um, So you're going to need to come up and tackle. Chase is unbelievable after the catch. He can make you pay. Um, I say good luck defending the comeback routes. They're very effective. Um, Against any coverage, really, Chase and Higgins are so strong at the catch point and Burrow is so pinpoint accurate that they can throw that at any time. So we really need to play physical on the outside. Uh, one little tendency I notice with their offense is every time they use like a fast motion to the flat where a guy kind of just sprays to the outside, they're just using that as eye candy and then they're throwing it up the seam or, or down the middle and vice versa too. If they have a guy starting outside and he comes in and then they snap it, then they want to get it to the outside. So that's a little key that maybe we can pick up on. Um, they don't have that much of a run game. It was very vanilla, a lot of like inside zone from shotgun. So Overall, that's what I saw. How about for you? Yeah, I mean, you touched on pretty much all of it right there. But this, listen, this offense runs through mainly two people, Jamar Chase and T. Higgins. But there are some issues with this offense, and it it causes them to sputter at times and not really play to their full potential. And that really has to do with some of their offensive line issues, right? When they're a healthy offensive line, they're probably about, you know, league average, probably maybe a little bit better than league average. 
on a good day, but they're dealing with a lot of injuries right now. They're, one of their starting tackles is out for the year. Orlando Brown, their other starting tackle, left last game. He was limited this week in practice. Uh, so there's just injuries on their offensive line. But what happens is because their offensive line isn't all that great, they're struggling to run the ball. And since their offensive line isn't that great at holding up and protecting and letting routes develop down the field, they're 25th in average depth of target. So they're really reliant on the pass to move to get the offense moving. Um, and you can see this because they're tied for 25th in yards per carry on first down. That puts them in second and long a lot. And when you get when they do get to second and long, Burrow has the second lowest average depth of target because he doesn't want to hold the ball too long and get put in bad positions. He wants to make sure that they get back on track because once they get to third and long, uh, when they do get to third and long, it's tough for them to get out of it because of the offensive line issues. Their pressure rate drops from 12th to 21st once they get to third and medium plus. So they really try and stay out of long down and distance situations. Um, but they probably should be throwing it more on first down. They only throw it at the 12th highest rate on first down, which, I mean, it is in the top half of the league, but when you consider that they are 30th in uh, yards per carry on first down, they probably should be leaning into that a little bit more and then maybe uh, run it on shorter second down situations. Now, it is tough to get them into these longer down and distance scenarios. They are pretty good at not getting behind the sticks for the most part, especially with who Joe Burrow is. Right, so they need to win first down in this game and then be prepared for quick game on second down. If not, it's going to be hard to get pressure on Joe on Burrow. And I will add this final thing. I personally would not blitz Burrow. And this year, he's killing the blitz. He's, his passer rating when blitz is first in the NFL at 142.8. It's 98.3 when not blitz. That's still 10th in the NFL. And that's what's going to happen when you play good quarterbacks. But he has been killing people that have been blitzing him. And when you blitz him, he gets the ball out extremely quick. His uh, passer rating under pressure is 105. So his passer rating when under pressure is higher than when he's not blitzed. So it's probably a better idea to uh, sit in coverage, not let him get the ball out quick, because uh, he will identify where that's coming from and get it to his playmakers. And when you're down a guy on the back end because you sent someone to uh, get a little pressure, well, that can lead to some big plays. But I'll say this last thing before I throw it back to you, um, before we get into player matchups. Uh, I think Zach Taylor versus Vic Fangio, I would give this edge to Fangio. I know a lot of Bengals fans just aren't happy with Zach Taylor right now. And when you look at this offense, you would think that they would be a little bit more uh, consistent. You know, they they are uh, around somewhere between, I think I said it's eighth in EPA per play. Their success rate, I think, is uh, around 13th. So it's similar to how the Eagles can hit on big plays, but they'll sputter at times as well. So um, having said that, I, I do think Fangio has a bit of an edge here if I had to look at this coaching matchup but Eric did you have any other thoughts on uh this on this team scheme wise before we jump into some of these players yeah I agree with you that blitzing burrow is a dangerous game and for I mentioned this uh previously that I had kind of put some blitzes on Twitter that I thought would be effective and in preparation for this week I actually decided I don't want to blitz so instead, I, I put a man coverage uh, play that kind of brackets Jamar Chase. They When they run um, a condensed split where he'll be the lone receiver on one side, but he's kind of tight to the formation, they've been lethal because uh, he just has so much room to work with. Sometimes in one-on-one -on -one coverage, I don't want to put Q or Slay or anyone in one-on-one -on -one coverage against in those scenarios. So that that's just one thing uh, I would touch on to be vigilant about. Yeah, absolutely. And so speaking of uh, the players, we'll we'll jump into them now. Listen, we touched on the guys a a little bit, but let's let's fill in the blanks here. Um, so touching on Joe Burrow, uh, just to explain who this guy is: quick, decisive, and accurate, with enough athleticism to hurt you. He he hit a fifty-yard touchdown versus the Giants. He's currently fourth in passing touchdowns, sixth in passing yards. Third best in passer rating, 14th in time to throw, fourth best completion percentage, first in on target percentage, and second best turnover worthy throw rate. So this guy has a lot going for him. And I mean, when you talk about his number one guy, Jamar Chase, I mean, he's a prototypical height, weight, speed receiver, primarily plays on the outside. He was a fifth overall pick in 2021. He currently leads the NFL in receiving yards with 620. He leads the NFL in yards and yards after contact over expectation. 
So like you said, you have to know where this guy is at all the time, and you have to rally to the ball. But Joe Burrow and Jamar Chase are really kind of a package duo, and it has been that way all the way since college, their college days at LSU. But you, you got any more to add about these guys? Burrow's accuracy is unbelievable. You mentioned his on-target throw percentage is number one in the NFL. Watching on film, it doesn't surprise me. And it's, in a way, highly reminiscent of how Tom Brady operates. Just the processing level and that intermediate accuracy jumps off the film. Uh, A lot of anticipation throws. A lot of the things that Eagles fans wish they'd see out of Hurts, you do see that in Burrow. One small critique is if you're throwing pinpoint accurate anticipation throws, he does have a penchant for throwing hospital balls where he'll throw guys directly into gigantic hits. You want to take advantage of that, you know, make them feel it. And I think that I actually are vulnerable to having some focus drops at times if they are worried about getting smoked. So I hope the Eagles play physical. We saw that from Q last week. Um, and yeah, just emphasizing like those guys in contested catch situations, very strong hands. So you got to really play through through the hands with some physicality. Um, you're not if you're in their hip pocket, that's not enough. So just wanted to emphasize that. Yeah, for sure. And the thing is, uh, Jamar Chase needs his Robin, right? When T Higgins isn't on the field, it makes life way harder for Jamar Chase. But when you look at T Higgins right now. He's no slouch either, and he's actually been getting targeted at a higher rate than Chase. When you look at these guys since week three, because T. Higgins was out the first two weeks, since week three, T. Higgins has a 28% target share to Jamar Chase's 23%. Next on the team is Zach Moss at 11%. And then when you look at specific situations on third down, again, since week three, since T. Higgins came back, on third down, 38% target share to Jamar Chase's 26%. Red zone, 26% target share versus Jamar Chase's 22%. So the Eagles are going to have to make sure that T Higgins isn't just tearing these guys up as well. He can beat you if you take bad angles, but he's not a guy that's going to outrun you if you have, if you are taking a good angle. So he doesn't have as much of that game breaking ability to him like Jamar Chase does. But listen, you throw a jump ball down the sideline to him. He's going to come down with a 50 yard catch uh, enough times in the game to hurt you. So You really got to pay attention to him as well. You can't fall asleep on T. Higgins. Now, looking at the front, and I don't know why we never start there because this is the most important part of football, right? But who is blocking Jalen Carter this week? This week, it's going to be Alex Kappa. And listen, he's a solid player. He has good technique and understanding of the position, but I don't think he has the athletic ability and just the raw strength and power to match with Jalen Carter all game long. And like I said, when you look at the rest of the offensive line, They could be dealing with some injuries. If Orlando Brown is out, Cody Ford at left tackle, he is the mark at the poker table, right? You want to attack this guy if he is going to be playing. I would even make make sure Huff is going to get some opportunities to rush against this guy as well. Um, But I don't think this is going to be a high pressure rate game. Just the way that the Bengals play and the way that Joe Burrow plays, he doesn't, he gets the ball out quick enough where he's not taking a lot of pressures. But if you can get him to long down and distance situations, Keyword if they should be able to get pushed up the middle and win off the edge, like I said, especially if Cody Ford is in. But having said that, Eric, what do you think game plan wise that this defense needs to do to slow them down? In 2021, Fangio uh, played against the Bengals and ran a lot of man concepts to great success. And I think he'll look back to that and think maybe we can lean on more man coverage than we would typically. Um, and that's what I would recommend. It seems counterintuitive because normally you're like, oh, we're going against the Patriots. They have no wide receivers. We'll run man and we'll be good. And then you go and you're like, well, these have one elite receiver, another who's really good. You don't want to run man. But that's actually been the most effective coverage against them. And it's a one thing that very really shocked me is it's on film and the analytics support this. Jamar Chase doesn't generate a ton of separation. Um, now if he catches it in space, he can run for a touchdown. If he, if you're right up against him, he can just bully you, but it's not like, you know, he's some fleet footed quick guy. Who's going to just cook you like CD lamb. That's not quite his game. So I I would be comfortable playing man coverage. 
probably bracket chase uh, when necessary, like I mentioned, when he's the lone receiver in a condensed split. One thing I talked about early in the podcast was that Burrow is so quick to be ready to deliver the pass because he has his pre-snap read. He's like, okay, this is probably what I want to get to. But then there's the post-snap verification. Okay, that actually is the coverage I expected. Now, he pretty much gives it away where he wants to go with his shoulders. Um, I saw snaps where guys would read him, jump into the window, and then he'd have to eat it, and then the pass rush got there. So really be good about, like, vigilant about reading his eyes really quick post-snap. Um, and then you mentioned not blitzing him, which I agree with in general, but if you're going to blitz him on early downs, I think it's a good time to do it, number one, because... You can keep them in long yarded situations potentially. And look, if they're gonna move the sticks, it's not the worst thing in the world if they're, you know, beating you in a contested catch situation in man coverage when you're blitzing. So yeah, really challenge them, play physical. The the to me, I think the thing that wouldn't work is if you're just playing like this traditional single high, like cover three and letting Burrow just scan the field, that's not gonna work. And we saw some of that stuff early in the season where we weren't like matching routes in cover three. And so I, I think Fangio is smart enough to realize what the Eagles are effective at. But I, I think that may surprise some fans that I'm recommending man coverage may be more effective. Well, it's interesting because I, I look at, you know, I, I build up models for, you know, I talked to talked about it in the off season, build out models to help with projections for the draft. But also build out models for, you know, fantasy and projecting for betting as well. And part of my model is looking at and look how these guys are performing against certain coverages. And by far, the worst coverage that Joe Burrow is against is cover one. It's not even close. His yards per attempt and his completion percentage are like half of every other coverage. Um, so I shouldn't say half our completion percentage. He, he's completing like 50% of his passes against cover one. Uh, which is kind of crazy. Um, so I agree with you. I think it is a situation where you can't play man coverage against these guys. And really because this offense is filtered and funneled through two people very specifically. You know, so if you can go out there and play man coverage against Jamar Chase and you can do things like have your safety, post safety, shade to his side a little bit more, or you can straight up have certain types of brackets. You can do a number of different things in man coverage to kind of isolate or or not let, uh, Jamar Chase just be completely one on one, right? And then on the other side of that, I like T Higgins, but if T Higgins is going to go out there and beat me all game, all right, then I guess I will take that. I think we can't, we have good enough corners where is T Higgins going to make some plays? Yes, I'm not saying he's not going to make plays, but I think our guys can make some plays too, especially in man coverage. And then you look at they just been, they haven't been as good against man coverage. After cover one, the coverage he's worse against next is cover six. The Eagles don't run cover six a lot, but they run pretty much the sister of that, which is cover eight, right? So it's not like that they run cover one a lot. They really don't. But we do see some games where they will come out and run a lot of man coverage. And then I think this is going to be a situation where we do run some cover eight because there are going to be times when you do want to play zone coverage, you're, you are going to want to keep a deep safety over top of Jamar Chase. So I think this really aligns well with what the Eagles like to do and what Fangio has shown that he will do in terms of seeing what the weakness is of a team and running those type of coverages. I'll add the, one more thing too. I, I think they're going to run some, uh, we haven't really seen it much, but some man under two deep types of coverages. And with that, I, most people think the safeties just play deep halves and they can, but you can also have your safeties play a quarters technique. And then instead of playing a deep half, you're also kind of bracketing more so like the slot receiver. So you could change that up based on like if uh, Jamar Chase slid into the slot on this play, you could have the safety play a quarters technique and that way you're getting a bracket on him while having a guy play dedicated man coverage on that guy. And the last thing I will say, you mentioned uh, with the, you would blitz on first down. I would still send creeper pressures, but just don't put six or five guys in coverage. You want to keep seven guys in coverage against Joe Burrow. But moving on to this Bengals defense, because there, there looks like there should be a matchup advantage here. This Bengals defense is led by veteran and well-respected defensive coordinator Lou Anarumo. It's headlined by Trey Hendrickson, and they have a good duo at linebacker in Jermaine Pratt and Logan Wilson. They're 20th in points per game, 22nd in yards per game, and 24th in EPA per play. 
So this defense has some weak spots, Eric. Uh, what did you see on film? You know, 29th ranked run defense, it shows up. They play really light boxes. Anytime a team spreads out the field, they have four guys on the line with pretty wide splits, and then they just chuck two linebackers in the middle of the field, and that's it. And it's not working. Even in short yardage situations or red zone, they'll still do that. That they, they pretty much correlate their box relative to the alignment of the offense, regardless of where they are on the field, which I find bizarre. Um, they, the terrible eye discipline from their edge rushers and, and linebackers at times, very susceptible to run fakes, especially when the linemen are pulling, the entire team just goes with it. Uh, so you can, there's so many counters that you can use to your advantage if a team is susceptible to that. Um, I've specifically identified like quarterback runs as something the Eagles could do, but I want to get them moving north south and not east west. Um, uh, but uh, you know, a lot of play action concepts where you get everyone going one way and then you just toss it to the other side of the field. Um, so that that's really you know scheme wise they're. Pretty vanilla. You mentioned a well-respected defensive coordinator. I'll tell you who isn't respecting him is Bengals fans. I, I tuned in to some of their podcasts and they're pissed about the defense. But it they've come, you know, in the past two weeks they played better. But it's they played the exact same teams the Eagles did. And those were not good offenses. So, yeah, not much to speak of scheme-wise. How about for you? Yeah, so... It's funny that you bring that up about uh, the Bengals fans not liking Lou Anarumo because what really is the problem there is that their players stink. And it's the same thing that we we hear over and over again whenever the Eagles players aren't playing good. First place we go is blame the coach. Listen, Lou Anarumo is a guy that shut down Patrick Mahomes and the reason they got to the fucking Super Bowl. So let's stop with this coach shit. It's the fucking players. God. All right, I'm getting off my high horse there. Anyway. Listen, this defense has played down to their competition for much of the season. I mean, even like the Patriots game, Ramondre Stevenson was running all over them. I will say this, though. They have adjusted the past few weeks, and they've been playing much better run defense. Even in the Ravens game, uh, Derrick Henry went for over 90 yards. But it took until the fourth quarter, excuse me, overtime for him to hit like a 50-yard run. Um, they've been playing much better run defense as of late. Now, having said that, is that going to hold up against the Eagles? I'm going to say probably not. But we did see the Bengal, or the Browns, who had been getting run on, and they really came out and said, we're not going to let the Eagles run on us. And they had to adjust. So we'll see how that comes out uh, this week. And when I look at Lou Anarumo, the thing with him, he reminds me a lot of Fangio, a lot of Fangio, because he varies his defensive approach based on who he's playing. He will switch up how he plays based on the opponent. And you'll see that with like how many times he'll uh, stack the box based on certain opponents. Um, or, or if they'll play light boxes, they'll definitely stick in two high shells when they're playing teams like the Chiefs uh, back when they were with had Tyreek Hill and, and Travis Kelsey. So he'll, he'll mix it up. He'll also, I think he does want to primarily be a two high uh, shell defense like Fangio. And he, while they're average in blitz rate, similar to Fangio, he, they're seventh in Sim and Creeper pressures and the Eagles are third. So I see a lot of similarities between these guys. Um, I, I feel I saw a little bit more spot drop zones uh, usage than um, what the Eagles do, though the Eagles, I mean, they, they mix in some spot drops zones as well. But here's the thing. How are they going to play the Eagles? Because I, I think that's really where this conversation has to go. And it's a guessing game because what are they going to do? Are they going to load the box to stop Saquon? Well, listen, you're going to be putting A.J. Brown and Devontae Smith one on one. And we're going to get to their corners because they're not very good. But. Because of that, I don't think they're going to sit there and man coverage then, even though they do run a significant amount of, amount of man coverage based on their percentages um, overall through the year. But that can change game to game, right? So I think they'll probably rely on a ton of cover three, but even then, that's still single high coverage. AJ and Devontae will still kill them, even if they might just be beating them on deep out routes and curls and comebacks instead of as many, uh, you know, just go balls. But if they're going to stay, stop, stay light to stop the big plays on the passing game, I think it's Saquon all day, but here's the thing. I don't, they know that, I think everyone's seeing that the Eagles are turning into a team that wants to run the ball. They know what they are really good at right now, so I think they want to run the ball um, if they can. If someone takes it away, then sure, they're going to go some more of a drop uh, pass-happy attack, 
But because of that, I think they're going to run a lot of cover three variations. They're going to load the box a little bit more than they have in previous games. I do think they're what they're going to do to kind of maintain that illusion of complexity is they're going to drop guys off the line and send other guys with these creeper pressures or, th or they will rotate the coverage in certain ways. Um, and another thing too, I do think they're going to mix in a, a good amount of cover zero here because we saw them do this, especially against Lamar Jackson. And we know that J Jalen Hurts has and this Eagles offense has struggled with this in the past. So, and Lou Anarumo, if he knows there's a weakness that you have, he's going to try and exploit it. So I think we'll see them get tested there. But did you have anything else to add into that before we jump into some of these player matchups? No, I, I also noticed that the, they, they, the Bengals defense, they want to dictate to the offense by playing aggressively at times, especially like in short yardage situations. But like you said, they just haven't been able to pull it off because lack of talent, it seems like. Um I, I, you know, I wouldn't necessarily call them a passive defense. They and I think uh, Hertz described them as gritty. Now, a lot of what he says in interviews is lip service, but on this one, I believe him. And so you, you know, you just want to assert that you actually have better talent and and don't let them dictate to you. Yeah, for sure. But here's the thing: they do have some players on this defense. And number one, we have to talk about him, Trey Hendrickson. I, I. Hardcore football fans know how good Trey Hendrickson is. I don't know if a lot of people know how good this guy is. If someone wants to tell me that Trey Hendrickson's a top five edge rusher, I'm not arguing with them. This guy is really, really good. He's fifth in sacks across all positions. He's seventh in pass rush win rate. And this is a guy you just cannot let him. You cannot let Trey Hendrickson beat this team because the rest of their guys on, on their front, they just don't get pressure. They're not generating a lot of pressure in sacks. Uh, so you just really need to dedicate, make sure he is not beating you. This is not like playing Brian Burns. The Eagles were comfortable letting Fred Johnson go against Brian Burns one-on-one -on -one for a good portion of that game. And he locked him up a number of times. That's not the case here. I really hope they don't try and throw Fred Johnson out there and say sink or swim, dude. But I don't know, man. What, what do you think uh, about Trey Hendrickson? He is the anti-Brian Burns. I, I talked about it in the Giants preview that... To me, the perception of Burns being so good is because of how aesthetic his play is and his body. Hendrickson's body is not impressive. His moves don't look impressive, but they're insanely effective. And one thing I would note about him specifically is, and I'm sure the stats would back this up, he's converting his pressures into sacks at a very high rate, and he's done that for years. And it's his pursuit abilities. Once he gets free like around the corner... He's just like a missile laser locked on the quarterback. And then he just jumps and latches on and gets him down every time. Um, he can wreck the game. And like you said, outside of him, their pass rush is non-existent. So help on Hendrickson um, for sure. And there's also other ways without helping that you can exploit an edge rusher who likes to get up the field quickly. We'll expand on that a little bit later. But yeah, 100% agree. We can't let him wreck the game. Yeah. And as long as you take care of him, Jalen Hurts should have time in the pocket. So let's look at some of these other players, though. Their linebacker duo is pretty good. Jermaine Pratt and Logan Wilson. This is a good duo. Both of these guys find the ball a lot and they don't miss many tackles. And both of them are good in coverage. I would try to figure out ways to get them out of the run game, at least one of them out of the run game, and try and get a corner in the run game somehow just through formation and motion. Because while they don't have like the best, they don't have the best front in terms of like talent that's gonna just get behind the line and create a lot of negative plays, this duo behind them with their linebackers can really clean up and and uh help help out with what their front is lacking. Absolutely. I think they're like vacuum cleaners and you can see it on film that they like to funnel everything to these guys in the middle. And, and like you said, they're not missing tackles. And if you look at their tackling stats, it's like they're both in the 70s and then the next highest after them is in the 30s. So they're the guys who are cleaning up everything. Um, so, yeah, you, you definitely... You know, one, have ways where you get linemen up to that level and take them out. Or, like you said, use formational creativity and motion to try to pull, like, the nickel corner 
into the run fits. Yep. And listen, when we look at the rest of this defense now, though, especially the secondary, man, this this corner group is it's not it's not a great group. And that's why it's hard to you can only blame the coach so much. Some these players got to play at some point in time. Their best corner is on injured reserve, Dax Hill. Cam Taylor Britt, their other corner, got benched in the Panthers game. So they had to put their backup corner in DJ Turner. He's a fantastic athlete. He is a bit undersized, though. He's committed a, a number of pass interference penalties on deep passes. Um, and he can be beat. Put AJ Brown on this guy. He can, he's not going to be able to physically match up with him on slants, on uh uh crossing routes, on uh fade balls, on go balls down the sideline. AJ's going to be able to hold his line. He's not going to get bumped off his line. He's going to win that body positioning battle against DJ Turner. Even though he ran like a 4-2-6, I, I, have no, I see no problem of AJ Brown beating DJ uh, Turner or Cam Taylor Britt for that matter. It doesn't, they could really attack either one of these guys. DJ Turner, when I saw on film, for as much speed as he has, I mean, he's a young guy, but as much speed as he has, he needs to trust his speed. He just flips his hips and opens them up way too early. And then, and press, he's just too jumpy. Uh, he can get beat off the line by either AJ or Devontae pretty easily. Cam Taylor Britt, he's 110 out of out of 115 qualifying corners and yards per target. So again, just not a not the duo that you want facing this Eagles attack. And then when you look at the front and everything else combined with it, and how they are have not been stopping the ball for most of the year. This is not a great matchup for this uh, for this Bengals defense. But did you have anything else to add? I think there may be a little bit of a public perception of Taylor Britt being really good because he's had some amazing highlights. But like you said, he's also given up as many big plays as his highlights, actually more. He And so while both of their outside corners are very fast, I none of them can have a chance in hell of being able to hold up with AJ Brown just physically. We saw how that ended with the Giants. Um and then just to touch on their safeties, you Geno Stone was a guy that we highlighted in the offseason that was potentially a target and he just looks old now and he doesn't have a lot of range and I don't think Von Bell is a game changer either. So overall this is a secondary that we should be able to attack. And ironically, I don't think we're going to need fancy route combinations to beat them. Although I'd like to see that. Uh, but yeah, you know, we got to keep Hendrickson out of the backfield and, and we should be able to beat them. Yeah. And Von, you, good point, Mint, bringing up Von Bell. Listen, he's a good player, right? But when they were going to the Super Bowl, who did they have back there? Jesse Mother F and Bates, right? He made a lot of that stuff work. He, a guy like that makes these kind of defenses work. Lou Anarumo doesn't have that right now. So it makes things a lot more difficult. But looking at the offensive game plan, how would you try to attack this defense? You mentioned how their run defense has gotten better in recent weeks, but I think the Eagles being an elite rushing attack should definitely lean on that, especially considering that the Bengals will play really light boxes if you spread them out. So there's a chance, very easy opportunity to stay ahead of the six, something that Hurts highlighted in his interview that they know they need to do because they got in a bunch of third and longs and didn't convert them last year. Or sorry, last week. Incorporating run fakes with polling linemen to capitalize on their poor eye discipline that was all over their film creating opportunities for quarterback runs and play action passes. And that's hitting the easy button. And that's something they should do on their first drive so they can actually score points for once. Chip Hendrickson or make him pay for rushing the passer too aggressively. Eagles fans will remember what we did against Micah Parsons years ago with trap plays, screen swings, QB design runs, sometimes leaving him unblocked entirely. And actually that neutralized him. That's the approach in part, I would take with Hendrickson when you're not chipping or straight up double teaming. And, and I think that that would contribute to an effective game plan. What what would you cook up? Yeah, so pretty much everything you said, you, you want to run the ball against this uh, team. And especially, you want to keep Joe Burrow off the field. Because the more he gets to look at your defense and figure out what you're doing, the more points he's going to score. So don't let him be on the field uh, or keep him off the field for as much time as you can. 
Now, we talked about it. I talked about it a little bit earlier. How do you run the ball against them? It's not just to say run the ball, but how I would, like I said, I would use formations and motions to either bump the linebackers out and slide the nickel in or just use the formation and pre-snap to force situations where the linebackers are going to have to respect uh, the RPO or pass game to one side. And then it forces a corner to put fit into the run fit on the other side, right? When you're using those three by one nub tight end formations. You uh, mentioned with Trey Hendrickson as well, all the stuff I, I would have brought up as well, but I will say this, I would use play action pass concepts with him on, in, on plays where like you're running uh, to his side, you'd be running like, it's almost looking like it's a gap scheme run where you down block with the tackle and then you pull with the guard. That forces defensive ends to have to honor the run fake. And if they don't, then you know you can keep running gap scheme runs right at him because he's getting too far up the field and not honoring the run and he'll create a vertical seam. So really make him make that decision. Is he going to get off the line and rush the passer on those plays? Or is he going to respect the run? And then you can get your guards to slide over. And at that point in time, when he's not just flying off the snap, um, once you can get someone to stop their feet for a second, it gives the offensive lineman a much better chance to block him. But if they're going to say they're going to come out and commit to taking away the run, then AJ and Devontae are going to feast against single high. But that's what I got for our offensive game plan. So to wrap this up, how do you think this game is going to go? What's the score prediction? You made a great point about keeping Burrow off the field, limiting the possessions. Bottom line, if they get a lot of possessions, they're going to put up a bunch of points. But ultimately, I have the Eagles winning 28-27 in an absolute barn burner. It's going to come down to the end, in my opinion, if it shakes out the way it looks like it will. Uh, but I'm just being optimistic here. So one point victory. Yeah, they are uh, underdogs uh, as of this recording. But if I'm being honest, I could see this game going either way, being a situation where this ends up being a lower scoring game than we expect. But I could very easily see this becoming a situation where it becomes a high scoring affair. Listen, the Bengals tend to play down to their competition and be conservative. So if it's a they're playing a team that isn't going to push them to score offensively, they won't push the pace to score offensively. But the Eagles can do that, right? By running the ball to stay at the head of the sticks. This defensive, this defensive line is likely not to pressure Jalen that much, assuming they can take care of Trey Hendrickson. The Bengals will be forced to push the ball in that situation. When Burrow has to get aggressive, they do start hitting big plays. And both teams can move the ball. But the Eagles' red zone defense is second best in the NFL right now. And the Bengals' red zone defense is 27th worst in the NFL. So for that reason, I have the Eagles winning 28-23, to getting four touchdowns while the Bengals sputter out a few times and have to kick some field goals. But that will be all for us. Make sure to check back in as we hopefully recap a victory podcast. But as always, like, subscribe, spread the word. And until next time, Go Birds.